uh, people with us live on Zoom and a bunch more on YouTube. So uh, thank you once again, Lenny, for joining us today and all of you all who are live with us from uh, all over the world today. Um, Quick agenda for those who joined right after, very quickly, um, we'll give you a short intro about the community, a short intro about our speaker's profile today, uh, what he's gonna cover, and then jump right into a 30 minute session with Lenny today on how to scale, build, seed marketplaces. Any questions you guys have can add it to the Slido link. Uh, so that in the last 30 minutes of this session, we'll pick up the most popular ones. Um, jumping right in um, for, for folks who are new, the product folks is a volunteer driven community um, where we share resources. We have a bunch of events. We have Learn PM with me, which is a curated link of resources. We have uh, insojo.club, which is an early stage APM program. Um, we're coming up with a bunch of things. So in case you guys wanna get involved, um, our Twitter DMs are open. Um, without further ado, I think uh, for, the, for the session that we're here at, today. Uh, jumping into um, our speaker's profile. Uh, welcome Lenny firstly to this session once again. Thank you. Um, I think Lenny needs no introduction, but just to give you a background for all those folks who haven't, you know, stalked him on LinkedIn already. Uh, currently, he's been uh, investing in a bunch of startups. So uh, he's been sharing his learnings around product, around growth, um, around uh, you know his his personal journeys, his interesting things that he's been seeing in the ecosystem on his personal newsletter. Um, we'll share that link in the chat section as well. So for folks who aren't following, you know that newsletter, I think it's it's great value. It's one of the best ones that we've seen so far, and we've also requested uh, requested him for like an exclusive discount code for this community. So hopefully we'll get something and maybe Lenny has some surprises for us towards the end. Um, apart from that, yeah, just before getting into uh, his current gig, uh, he was leading product. Um, he was uh, he was leading product at Airbnb, where he was focusing on supply growth. Not really. I wasn't leading product. That's uh, very, okay. very he flattering. Was a product lead at um, at Airbnb, where maybe yeah. maybe he'll clarify that clarify that when when the season starts, but yeah, that's that's something that maybe that much I know about him. Uh, yeah, his entry into Airbnb was uh, via an acquisition of his startup that is Local Mind. So we'll definitely want to hear more about this in the session. Some interesting points there as well. But interesting point here to note is that isn't the first acquisition that he's been part of. He was uh, earlier a part of a startup uh, called uh, Webmetrics, where he was a lead engineer uh, acquired by Newstar, where I think he was um, there for another seven years. So seven years at Airbnb, seven years before that, and was leading R&D just before dropping off. So maybe some clarifications there, but. So uh, yeah, that, that's been an interesting career. So we'd love to hear more about that as well, Lenny. And um, I think for today's session, he's gonna be covering you know, some challenges on how to tackle marketplace problems. So yeah, without further ado, jumping right into the session, over to you, Lenny. Hi guys, thank you for having me. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, I've, I hadn't heard of the product folks until I asked on Twitter for what are the most uh, active and just engaged product management communities. And I don't know if it's your members or just people that are big fans of you guys, but the, uh, the, re the tweets were very passionate and supportive. So I'm excited to be here and sharing. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking uh, for about 30 minutes about this research that I did around marketplaces. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna do 30 minutes of Q and A. So let me uh, switch to my presentation. Here we go. Cool, can you guys see that? I can't see the chat, but I'm gonna assume that we're good. Yeah, we can We can see your yeah. uh, okay, cool. screen lighting. Yeah. Okay, cool, okay, cool, great. Okay, so yeah, so I'll be talking through this thing. This usually uh, takes me about 45 minutes. I'm gonna go a little fast and maybe I'll just cut it off if we're running out of time. And so what we're gonna be talking about is basically uh, the results of a, of a bunch of research that I did into how to kickstart and scale a marketplace business. Um, but uh, to kind of cover a little bit about me uh, and to clarify. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I've been working on this newsletter recently. That's kind of one of the main things I'm doing. I'm also doing some investing. And before that, so I was a, I was a PM at Airbnb for seven years. I led supply growth for two and a half years. I worked on booking conversion for two, two to three years. Uh, worked on the community for a while. 
and help launch the Superhost program and worked on reviews and things like that. And I left about a year ago. Before that, I had the startup called Local Mind that uh, we had for a year and a half. And before that, I was an engineer, engineering manager. And <clears throat> this uh, research was basically based on interviews with founders and early growth people at essentially all of the biggest marketplace companies. There was about 17 companies in the end and about 24 people that I ended up talking to to understand how they kickstarted their companies and their marketplaces. And all of this comes from a bunch of really smart people that basically deserve all the credit because they're the ones that gave me all of this, all these stories and insights. I just essentially collected it and turned it into a little, into a framework. So big shout out to all these people. And the way that this talk is structured is there's kind of two phases. There's cracking the chicken and egg problem, and then there's scaling. And, and these are very different uh, phases of getting a marketplace going. So that's why I split it up this way. And so we're gonna talk about them in two different ways. And so before that, let me just talk about what a marketplace is, why a marketplace is interesting, and a few disclaimers. So first of all, what is a marketplace business? The way I think about it, just kind of at the most simple uh, base is it basically connects people that have a thing, or sorry, that want something, which is demand, with people that have that thing. And then it just connects them and helps them uh, transact. That's it. That's how I think of what a marketplace business is. So here are some examples of marketplace businesses and uh, that, and many of these are the ones I talk to. Why are marketplaces interesting? Investors are really excited about marketplaces and uh, founders really try to start marketplace businesses and a lot of them do really, do really well. And the reason is one is they have built in network effects, which just means that the more users and especially the more supply that you end up getting, uh, the more useful it becomes to everybody else in the, in the business, especially new users. So it's a really a powerful way to build a business, which also leads to a really strong barrier to entry. It just means it's hard to replicate. It's hard to start from scratch. And so it, it becomes, you create a moat innately. Uh, and then also because they have no supply, they don't actually own the supply, like an Uber or an Airbnb. It's, it's really efficient. It's really scalable, really flexible. Three just disclaimers to keep in mind as I go through this. Uh, one is I'm going to talk about all these ways that they grew and all these growth tactics and levers. But in the end, none of these would have worked if they didn't actually have product market fit, if they weren't actually building something people wanted. So at the core of this is you actually need to have product market fit before any of these tactics will really work for you. So always come back to that. A lot of people overthink building a marketplace and they focus on all these marketplace -y things. But I'd say 90% of a marketplace business success is just like, is this a thing anybody wants? Two is, these are all based on interviews and things that happened in the past. And so don't assume that what happened in the past is going to work for you now. Just kind of focus on the way they thought about things and how they approached problems, not like do X, Y, Z, and you're going to become a massive marketplace. And then again, these are all based on memory and stories. And you know there may be some mistakes that people made, but I feel confident that this is what actually happened. So with that, let's get into phase one. So phase one is, is called cracking the chicken and egg problem. And the reason it's called chicken and egg problem is because when you're starting a marketplace, unlike a traditional business, say like an e-commerce business or a SaaS business, you basically have two sides that you have to figure out, supply and demand. So, and you basically have to figure out how to do them both well. For example, if you're building like a DoorDash or an Uber Eats, say you're trying to start that company, do you first go to the restaurants and try to convince them, hey, get on DoorDash. There's no customers yet, but it's going to be great. Just like sign up, uh, train all your staff, plug it into your systems, and one day we're going to send you customers. Do you do that first, or do you first tell people, download this app? There's going to be amazing restaurants on here. Just try it out. Check it once in a while, maybe every month, just in case there's new restaurants popping up, but, but there's no restaurants yet. That's, that's the challenge of a marketplace. And so it feels like you have to do all these things at once. And that's why it's called chicken and egg. Do you do the chicken? Do you do the egg? You know what I mean? And so one of the biggest takeaways from this research was that there's actually essentially four steps that every marketplace business goes through to get started, which to me um, blew my mind that it was this consistent and, this, uh, and there was almost a playbook to get a marketplace business started. And we're going to go through these four steps, but essentially it's constrain your marketplace, 
concentrate on one side or the other, build supply, then build demand. And so step one, constrain. <clears throat> so all this means is the first thing you wanna do when you're building a marketplace most likely is you wanna constrain the marketplace. which so just means create the smallest possible version of the marketplace. And there's two ways to do that. You can constrain by geography, which is essentially just one market. So say like New York or San Francisco, or you can constrain by category, like just tech events or just uh, Ikea furniture repair. And so here's, of the 17 companies I talked to, how it all came together. Um, so most companies and market, sorry, marketplaces started constraining around a market. So they picked one or two or three markets to start. The rest either constrained by category, and we're gonna talk about each of these. And then there's this one uh, exception of Thumbtack that didn't constrain, which we're gonna talk about. And I think the simple way to think about this is if you can constrain by geography, like essentially if you're a location oriented business where you have to meet people in real life, it makes sense to constrain by geography first. And if not, it makes sense to constrain by category first. And then again, there's Thumbtack, the exception. So let's talk about this geo examples of companies that focused on a geo uh, rover, which is a, a dog sitting marketplace where people watch your dog. They started in Seattle. So that was their geo constraint. And as you can read in this quote, Seattle was a really great market for them because it was really dog friendly and there's a lot of tech employees and Amazon was really friendly to dogs. Instacart, which is a grocery delivery business, they, they focused on markets where winter was approaching where people needed groceries, but didn't want to go out. Open Table had this uh, heuristic they figured out of they need 50 to 100 restaurants in a concentrated part of the city for them to feel like they have enough supply for it to be of any use. And, and so, so that's Geo. On the category side, Eventbrite, which is a ticketing events platform, they focused on tech events and tech mixers. So instead of geographically, they focused on you can launch an event anywhere, but let's go deep on events and tech conferences. TaskRabbit, which is kind of a handyman marketplace where you can get people to help you with handyman tasks. They focused on IKEA assembly, IKEA furniture assembly and house cleaning and moving help. And from what I understand, they feel like they actually should have focused more initially on something more concrete because they actually didn't do extremely well in the end and they should have constrained more. And then there's the one exception of Thumbtack and so here's kind of, here's the story that I got about Thumbtack. So Thumbtack is kind of like a, like you get plumbers and electricians and, and uh, you know, people that paint your house through Thumbtack. Um, and so what they kind of realized is you only need a plumber, I don't know, once a year, electrician once a year. And so in order to make this work, they decided let's just create every possible use case and go everywhere in the country, in the US at least, so that there's uh, more frequency of use so that you come back more often. And I think it worked for them, but I think it took them a long time to to make it work. And so I don't know if this is a, maybe to do this sometimes. I think it's maybe they worked in spite of it. It's unclear. So we talked about constraining the marketplace. That's step one. So create a tiny marketplace. Step two is figure out which side of the marketplace to focus on. Is it supply or demand? And one of the main learnings, and maybe the second most interesting learning is 80% of the marketplaces I talked to focused on supply first. So here's how it broke up. So most focused on supply and only three and very specific uh, use cases focused on demand first. So on the supply side, Lyft was essentially very clear to them that it was always supply that was gonna unlock more demand, just more drivers on the road was always their priority. DoorDash, same kind of thing. They, they looked at all the other companies in their space and it's always get restaurants on board, get people to deliver the food and then get demand. And so they found that it was always supply. Thumbtack, similarly, the founders looked at all the other biggest marketplace companies at the time and they found two things, which was kind of funny that the winners had all the supply and then their product didn't actually matter. And so all that mattered for them was let's get all the supply. And so that's what they worked on. So that's the supply and then on demand, Rover. So what's interesting about demand, just going back one is for all three of these companies, it was very clear to them that uh, supply was not a problem. And that's why they were able to focus on demand that supply came really easily. So with Rover, 
their pitch to the supply, which is dog sitters, was make 50 bucks watching a dog anytime you want. It's a pretty good value prop. And a lot of people can do it. And so they found that they had no problem finding people to, to agree to this thing. So supply was really easy for them for that reason. And then Zillow was interesting where they bootstrapped their marketplace off of public data that already existed. So they didn't even have to convince anybody to join a supply. They just kind of found housing data and put it online. And so they basically bootstrapped it. So I'd say a lesson for me from this was you're most likely gonna be demand constrained if you can offer your, your supply super easy work that's super flexible and help to make actual a lot of meaningful income because that's a really uh, great value prop. And so supply will come to you. Uh, and then there's an interesting example of Patreon, which is essentially a place where you can go and pay creators to create what they're doing. You know, like an artist that's painting, you can pay them like five bucks a month just to support them. And what they found, which this quote highlights is they thought they were a marketplace. They thought they were gonna be connecting creators and people that wanna pay creators. But it turns out that the demand side wasn't real. There wasn't like people looking for uh, creators to pay. They instead, what worked was creators just themselves found people that liked what they were doing and sent them to Patreon. So there wasn't any actual demand that was looking for new people to patron. So they realized there should just become just a great SaaS tool for creators and just make it easy for creators to make a living and not promise them any demand. So what they did is they cut off the entire demand side of the marketplace roadmap, pivoted to or just like a great SaaS tool, kind of like Shopify. And let's just become the best platform for creators to make money. And so that's super interesting. So that's one of the other interesting learnings is just make sure you're actually a marketplace if you're building a marketplace business, because sometimes you wanna be a marketplace, but nobody actually wants what you're selling. So be real with yourself. So that's that lesson. So we talked about constraining and then concentrating on supply or demand. Then the next step is essentially building supply. And even if you're not supply constrained, you'll find that you still need some supply. Basically it's stuff on the shelves for demand to even be interested in what you're doing. So it always starts with supply and then eventually you shift to demand and it's a question of how quickly. So in terms of growing supply, these are the 12 most popular growth levers for growing supply in all of these marketplaces. And I blocked off the top three just as a fun quiz. And so maybe in the chat, uh, what do you guys think is the first, second or third most common supply growth lever for these marketplaces. Okay, referrals. I'll give you guys a few, like in 30 seconds. Demand. Bunch of them coming on the chat section. And yeah, yeah, I'm watching the chat. I got it. Word of mouth, okay. Feed on street, oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. So you guys are basically right. Oops. Uh, here we go. Okay. So yeah, feet on the street. Whoever said that was right. So sales basically, exactly. Uh, was number one by far, if you can see that, uh, was the most common lever for growing initial supply. And we're going to talk about that. And then referrals was basically tied also. So a lot of people guess that's so a nice job. Uh, so referrals and piggybacking were the other two, and we're, we'll talk about what those are. So another interesting learning here is SEO barely ever used for early supply growth. Performance marketing, essentially Facebook, Google ads, also very rarely used for early supply growth. And so, so that's so to me that's really interesting. You'll see it becomes much more useful later on. Um, and so here's the top three and then the two that were not used, which a lot of people think that they wanna use initially, but I thought that was really interesting is for supply. That was not actually something people found useful. So going into each of these and giving a few examples, direct sales, essentially just like going to, direct sales is essentially door to door, direct emails, calling, just kind of reaching out to people and not counting on some product to find them. Um, so open table, they essentially just walked door to door from restaurant to restaurant, carrying their servers with them and pitching restaurants on what they were doing. 
even Airbnb uh, was very focused on direct sales initially, reaching out to homeowners and trying to convince them to join Airbnb. Piggybacking is essentially taking people that are in a, already in a, in a marketplace somewhere else or a platform and convincing them to come to you. And what's interesting is it's always Craigslist, essentially. Everyone always piggybacks off of Craigslist. So poor Craigslist, but they're still around. So, and so who knows? Um, so like Uber and Airbnb both piggybacked off of Airbnb, uh, off of Craigslist on the supply side. Referrals uh, tied with piggybacking. And so referrals are essentially you incentivize users to find you more users. So you pay them a little bit of travel of credit or money to find more users. And so it was a big deal for Lyft, it was a big deal for Uber, and big deal for uh, for Caviar, and then five out of the 17 found it really useful. Word of mouth was, was also really powerful, but uh, you'll see later, it was actually a lot more powerful on the demand side. So for open table, restaurants talk to each other, they hear what other restaurants are doing, and they're like, oh, you're doing open table? Let me check that out. Eventbrite, 36% of their supply comes from word of mouth. And Patreon, same thing. Creators talk to other creators and they, they do what they're doing. Uh, another interesting one is subsidizing where you essentially pay or invest in your supply to make it easier for them to start as supply. So Lyft and Uber both paid their initial drivers a salary to drive on Uber and to have like basically a minimum uh, salary so that they always made a, a minimum so that they drove and they're out on the street. And then eventually they got rid of that. And then Breather made their places really nice. Single player mode I thought was gonna come up more often and it's interesting how rarely it came up. Uh, and what single player mode is in a marketplace, you have to, it's only useful when the other side is there. So the question is, can you build a tool that's useful just to one side of the marketplace before the other side gets there? And the open table is famous for this. They started with a reservation system for restaurants that just became the best way to accept bookings without any sort of demand with no one actually coming through to book. And they got a bunch of restaurants on open table just by selling that product. And then they added demand later. And when they did, they had a ton of supply. And so that's how they built up their supply base. Performance marketing, basically Facebook, Google ads only useful for Uber and Lyft, but it was actually really important for them. SEO only useful for Eventbrite, which is super interesting. So, uh, so a lesson here actually, so if you look at, I'll go forward one. If you look at the number of levers that each individual company used, even though there were 12 across, the, across this, uh, the, I'll go back, the median is actually only two. So only two levers were used by each company and about 2.5 on average. So going forward again, um, even though there's a lot of options, one of my lessons here is um, that don't try to do them all. There's essentially gonna be a few that actually work for you. And I'd say focus on those. Don't try to just like, we'll grow faster and faster if we do all these things. It's rarely that any more work. And uh, someone asked the question of why SEO worked for Eventbrite initially. Essentially what they did is they uh, just put out white papers and content for event creators. It's like how to put on an event, how to sell out an event, how to be successful running an event. And so they created all this interesting content for, uh, for event creators and they found it through SEO. Uh, okay, so that's supply. So you've got supply going. So at some point you wanna start growing demand. And so the same thing, here's the top 12 growth levers that came out of this work that helped people kickstart demand. So what do you guys think are the top three growth levers for demand? Any guesses? SEO, community, word of mouth, interesting. Network effects. Okay, all right, well, you guys got it. Word of mouth, yeah, there we go. Word of mouth is uh, number one. Okay, good guesses, everyone. Uh, yeah, so word of mouth is, 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 the most is the most common way that demand uh, started for a lot of these marketplaces, which isn't really a growth lever. It's not like you can do a lot about driving word of mouth, but it says a lot about the fact that these businesses had really strong product market fit. 
So that's a signal that you're doing something right, that people talk about it. So that's it's still really interesting to see that. And then the second one we're gonna talk about is um, supply driving your demand, which is really interesting. It's kind of a, uh, a superpower if you can get this working in your in your marketplace where your supply drives your demand. We're gonna talk about that. And then SEO ended up being actually really powerful for demand versus supply. So I'm gonna talk about what supply and demand is. Um, and then let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, and then sales, interestingly, is not one of the bigger ones. So on the demand side, sales is only useful for a few of these companies, but not most of them. So, so we talked about these lessons and so we'll keep going. Um, so word of mouth. So word of mouth, by far the biggest lever for a lot of these companies. Um, so for Lyft, that's why they had these big mustaches, get people talking about it, open table. Essentially, it's the way they describe it. it all started word of mouth. Pe uh, people started talking about, hey, you can book tables on, on open table. You should download this app. On Airbnb, at one point, we did a survey and we, for the first time, learned that 50% of our growth was coming through just word of mouth and 70% of it on the supply side, which was really shocking because we thought we were doing so much great work and growth is up and everything's working, but ended up people just love talking about it and they're just sharing it with all their friends, which is good, but it just means that, uh, that everything's gonna look good when word of mouth is high. So supply driving demand, what this means is, uh, so for DoorDash, an example, it just means that the restaurants get their customers to download DoorDash and then they become DoorDash customers and then they use other restaurants. So for example, you go to your favorite restaurant, there's like a big sign, hey, download DoorDash to order this food online. Then you download DoorDash and then you're a DoorDash customer. Similar with Etsy, or sorry, with Eventbrite, the, uh, the creators, they organize an event and then they email out all their, all their email lists like, hey, sign up for my event on Eventbrite. And so they do all the work for you to drive demand to the site, which is really, uh, really incredible if you can pull that off. Etsy had this funny loop where the sellers also bought all of this stuff on Etsy because they, they needed it to make their stuff. So it became this like very powerful loop for them. So this is a really uh, awesome thing if you can, if your marketplace allows for this. Um, someone's asking what the difference is between word, referrals word of mouth. The, the difference is, Word of mouth is free, it's just happening organically. Referrals is you incentivize somebody to do it. You pay them money or credit. So SEO was the third most common growth lever, 17 out of, sorry, seven out of the 17 companies relied on this. And uh, Thumbtack is a good example where they basically eventually realized SEO was gonna work for them. And it ended up being 80 to 90% of the growth came from SEO, which worked by uh, having all these pages for all of their plumbers and electricians and um, uh, just people like searching, I need a plumber in San Francisco. And they got really good at owning SEO for that. Someone's asking for the demand slide. So I'm going to give you a link to this whole deck that you'll uh, be able to look at it on your own time. Uh, Grubhub also big on SEO is the number one growth lever for them. 30% of all their users came through SEO and performance marketing was useful for, it was the fourth most common lever. This is a really funny example. So Breather, it's a marketplace to book meeting rooms. And so the founder just kind of created this really interesting promoted tweet, where it was a tweet from him saying, hey, we're launching in New York. If anyone wants special access, just DM me. And he promoted that on Twitter and he got a ton of requests and asks. And it became a really cheap tweet to run because it was getting a lot of engagement. And the Twitter uh, people actually came to him and are at started asking him, what the hell are you doing? This is, this is working way too well. We got to learn from, from you. And so that worked for him. Um, PR was really big for TaskRabbit and Zillow. I'm going to kind of skip through these guys. Loops, which uh, loops were really powerful for a few companies, which is essentially create kind of a, a loop that new users drive more new users. So on Grubhub, they got menus of restaurants online. So they went to a restaurant, they scan their menu, put it online. Then people searching for that restaurant went to the site and found that menu. And then they converted that traffic to calling the restaurant ordering. And then they went to the restaurant and they're like, hey, we're getting all this demand for your restaurant. Do you want to join Grubhub? And then with more restaurants, they have more menus and more traffic. And then Etsy, similarly with the buyers and sellers buying their own stuff. So that's, that's the four steps. So that's part one. 
So these are the four steps every marketplace ends up going through. Um, and so phase two, so let's see on time. How are we on time? Should we keep going or should I pause? Uh, we could do that or maybe another 10 minutes. I think um, everyone's cool. really enjoying these slides. So we could do okay, cool. So let's do 10 more minutes. So I'll stop it. Yep. My time, 9.15. Uh, okay, so, so you've kickstarted the marketplace. You've uh, got it going. You kind of have this flywheel. It feels like people are buying and selling and coming back. So roughly you feel like something is working. Then there's this big uh, shift to okay, now let's grow this thing. Let's make this, uh, let's turn this in, let's get to the next level of growth. And so I like, that's essentially scale your marketplace from this uh, kind of constrained focused marketplace. And in this section, what I did is I asked people four questions. How do you know if your supplier demand constraint later? Because that isn't like a one-time um, forever supply constraint, forever de demand constraint. How do you decide which side, which side is more constrained ongoing? what growth levers work at scale. Turns out it's very different from what works initially. Three is how do you maintain quality? And then uh, what would you do differently? And so first question is how do you know if you're supply or demand constrained? Um, so here's, here's how the companies kind of landed after they got started. 40% of them were, ended up being always supply constrained. 40% of them ended up kind of somewhere in the middle and it depends on the market and the time of year. And then very few were always demand constrained. On the supply constrained side, essentially it was very clear to them that we're just like always going to be supply constrained. DoorDash was just like, we could always use more restaurants. The more restaurants we have, the more people are going to come and join DoorDash and use it. So it's always makes sense to focus on getting more restaurants on DoorDash as the main priority. Same thing with Uber, same thing with OpenTable. It was just like, very clear to them. On the demand side, similarly, it was very clear to them, okay, supply is not a problem. We can easily keep growing supply. TaskRabbit, for example, had a waiting list and they started actually charging a fee to even sign up to be a tasker. Um, and so supply was never a problem for them. So they always knew that more demand was always good for them. And then the more interesting group is on the it depends side. And what's interesting here is this, is that each company basically figured out, here's a here's kind of a heuristic or a model of how we know if we're a supplier demand constrained and when we should focus where. So with Grubhub, what they did is they sorted all of their markets by the orders per restaurant in that area. And they essentially focused on the supply and supply growth for all of the top restaurants in that list. So which, rest, which markets are just like the most highest ratio of orders per restaurant, which just means that just that more restaurants would help spread out that demand. And there's, there's a lot of demand in that market. So that's how they did it. They basically just looked at orders per restaurant. Um, Thumbtack had an interesting learning that if you're searching for a plumber in New York, if you have less than three results, your conversion and NPS score ends up being a lot lower. But if you have more than three, it goes a lot better. So they became focused on make sure there's at least three plumbers and electricians and painting uh, groups in every category in every market. So that was their goal. So it was always, that's when they knew they were supply constrained. And uh, Airbnb, uh, I worked on this a bit. We looked at occupancy rate in a market. So if it was above some percentage, say 70% of the rooms on a day in, in on Airbnb are booked, we figured out if this means we're supply constrained, even if it was a hundred percent book. And an interesting story is in uh, uh, in Uber's case, they were super supply constrained every Friday night because people wanted to stay home, but also everyone was going out and partying. And so a GM there had this really interesting idea. What if we double people's income on a Friday night and tell them if you're driving Friday night, we're going to double your income. We're just going to do it manually. Just trust us. And they did that and they got a ton of supply out on Friday night. And that turned into search pricing later in the core product team. And so that was a really cool scrappy innovation. So, okay, so that was how to know if your supplier demand constraint. Then it's then the question is just like what growth levers work when you're at scale. And this is what came out. And so what's interesting here 
is one, there's actually, so this is a combination of growth, uh, sorry, supply and demand across both sides of the marketplace. And, um, and what's interesting is one, there's a lot fewer growth levers that work at scale. So there were 12 in supply and 12 in demand previously. And here there's only eight that everybody uses to grow. And then two is performance marketing ends up being the most popular. And there's two new levers that emerge later on, expanding geographically and optimizing conversion. So those are kind of the lessons. There's fewer available levers as you grow. Performance marketing becomes really common. And then there's these two new levers that you can rely on. And so just a couple tidbits. So performance marketing was huge for Uber, big for Zillow. So like 50% of Uber's growth comes from performance marketing. Expanding geographically becomes a really important lever for a lot of companies, which just means, you know, you start in one market, let's go grow to more markets. For Instacart is a huge deal. It was grub, for Grubhub is one of their top two or three levers. And then conversion, a really interesting new lever that comes up later. And I think the reason this only emerges later is it's not gonna you know, 10X your growth, but it's gonna optimize your growth and improve growth in some incremental way. And so it becomes valuable down the road. So for Etsy, Zillow worked out uh, for them. SEO, fourth most common lever is long-term. So for OpenTable, they, they got to it late, but it ended up being really successful. And then Etsy, they ended up having millions of listings on Etsy and that became a really big driver for SEO. Referrals ends up being really popular. So for both Uber and Airbnb, it's like, you know, 10, 15% of, of, of growth. Um, but an important lever here, an important lesson here, as Gokul describes, uh, there's no silver bullet. You know, there's not gonna be this one lever that does everything for you eventually. There's gonna be just a bunch of lead bullets, a bunch of focus on a bunch of levers uh, that all add up to growth. And that's, um, before we get to the next section, um, but, I talked about how initially there was a lot of focus on two, two to two point five levers. When you're at scale, that that actually spreads out to three and three and a half uh, median levers that folks are using. So it just means that you end up using more and more levers down the road, which makes sense. And then maybe uh, I'll just kind of touch on this a little bit. So so as you're scaling, quality becomes a bigger challenge. How do you? How do you get great Uber drivers? How do you get great restaurants? How do you get great, great Etsy, um, Etsy sellers at scale? Because you're trying to grow, grow, grow. And these are essentially the, um, I think eight, one, two, three, ten. I don't know. <laughs> Most common uh, ways that these marketplaces focused on keeping quality high. The most common is is essentially creating standards and then penalizing. Uh, supply usually for doing a bad job and then annually onboarding, having a review system, the other things. So I'll just touch on a couple. So standards and penalties, the classic example on Uber, if you fall below a certain rating, you get kicked off. And the onboarding, essentially just kind of walking through with your supply and just showing them, here's how it works and here's a checklist, make sure your pictures are great, make sure your title is great, make sure your price is right. Um, and another interesting one is search ranking. Uh, it becomes a really powerful lever of just like uprank the good stuff and downrank the bad stuff. For Rover was a really big deal, Airbnb, same thing. Um, oh yeah, these are just uh, a couple fun stories and I'll end it with these guys. Um, both TaskRabbit and Rover found that there was really interesting signals you could get about how good supply is gonna be on your platform by asking you a few questions when you're publishing. So TaskRabbit gave kind of a mini uh, prof, like a personality test in, in the sign up flow. And they found out that people that are very service oriented and that, are, that wanna make people happy end up being really good TaskRabbiters. And then for Rover, uh, they asked this question of where does your dog sleep at night? They just asked you, where does your dog sleep at night? And it turned out if the answer was in my bed, they knew you'd be a really great, uh, dog sitter. And so they promoted people in the search ranking immediately if you answered in my bed to that question. And so I'm just gonna skip through the rest and here's kind of a quick summary and I'll send this deck out uh, and that's it. Let's get to Q and A.
Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much, Lenny. I think that was power packed. You know, a lot of examples, a lot of, lot of interesting points from both sides, supply and demand. So, um, um, I think, um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing the link as well. So maybe right after this session, we'll collect that from you and send it over to everyone. A lot of, lot of folks asking for that as well. So, um, Great. before we, yeah, thanks so much. Um, uh, given, given that we have about fifteen minutes to go in the session, we have currently. 42 questions on the Slido link. So guys, just one small request. In case you have any other questions, please add it right away. And uh, also just uh, take 30 seconds to go through the other questions or maybe a minute so that you know we you could help us prioritize the ones which you know the entire community is interested in. We'll um, pick up the most interest, like you know, the most voted ones. So everyone oh gets God. to learn together. So um, maybe just a 30 second pause. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> He sleeps in our bed. All right, all right. That's not good, I think. Super, super, super. Okay, one. Awesome. So we'll just pause for maybe just 30 seconds. Uh, I think lots of, lots of interesting things there. Uh, getting a couple of upvotes, couple of good questions coming in as well. Um, you guys can find the Slido link in the chat section. And we'll just begin in 30 seconds. Um, to break the rice. Is there any, Lenny, is there any poll that you'd like to put up on the Slido as well? Or any interesting, we have about, we have, we have a lot of people live right now, 300 odd across the platform. Anything that you'd oh, like, any interesting. Insights? Maybe, maybe if any who's building a marketplace business. Sure, sure, we could add that. We'll add that to the Slido one as well. So you guys could have put that. Impact investments, yes. Okay, uh, so uh, jumping right in, uh, Lenny, um, the most upvoted ones to start with. Um, given that you spoke a lot about marketplaces, supply and demand, we often see that you know um, an engagement layer is super important um, because, like you mentioned, you know acquisition, yes, but you know keeping that lot engaged. So, what are your thoughts on you know transactional marketplaces? How do you build an engagement layer here? Any examples, anything that you've seen? I don't think I understand what that question is. Uh, so, you know, uh, oftentimes I'll give you an example from what I understand. Maybe at Airbnb, uh, folks um, come, they, you know, do a booking once in a while, but is there anything that you do to retain oh, bring them? them back. Bring them back, yes. That's probably- Got it, yeah. Back. So we tried a lot of stuff at Airbnb. Uh, I wouldn't say anything was like incredibly powerful. I think with travel, especially at Airbnb, it's like, you travel maybe a couple times a year on a big trip and we're not going to like make you travel more often. And we, yep. even though we tried. And so, so we tried a bunch of emails, you know, these discounts are happening. Uh, some, there's a bunch of new homes. Uh, maybe it's a great time to travel again, but I'd say Airbnb, we, there wasn't a ton of success in getting people to come back more often. I'd say the core okay. of it is always just going to come back to what value can you provide your, audience, like what's actual value you can provide, not just a bunch of emails and pushes and texts. That's only going to do like a little bit. So I would focus on like, what can you actually do for, us, for your potential users? Fair, fair. Uh, probably we'll uh, jump through the questions a little quick so that we can cover. Yeah, yeah. I'll go fast. Yeah. I'll go yeah. fast. Uh, no, <laughs> just giving you a heads up because there are questions pouring in. So another interesting <laughs> one that we have right on top right now is more on your newsletter business. Um, we have a question asking, what is the secret sauce to growing a 75K ARR uh, USD um, content man? Is this a single man business that you're running right now? Or you know, how are you structuring this? Also, uh, if someone is starting out without any credentials, you know, right from the beginning and want to get it into a similar space and do it full time, any suggestions for them? Yeah, so I'm gonna paste uh, a deck that I put together. <clears throat> that will that be talks the through my whole, my whole uh, newsletter journey but i so there's two questions how do you how do you build a newsletter that makes money and then yep. two is how do you get started with that credentials yep so the deck talks through that first question and and the answer is just provide value to people if you uh if you actually if you help people be more successful or smarter or just do better they're gonna want to follow you and potentially pay for the content so i'd say 90 percent of it is just like put out valuable content. 
that is actually valuable. And then there's like 10% of try to optimize growth, you know, like run Twitter ads, tell friends about it, get people on Twitter talking about it. But the core of it is deliver actual value. But if you want a deeper answer, check out this deck that I just shared that has the entire journey. And then awesome. without credentials, I think it is, it is harder because you have to build a platform from scratch. And I think the answer is um, like, when, if you can actually deliver concrete value to people, other people with an audience are gonna want to share it and promote it. So always start with creating value, which is just like sharing really interesting insights or news or potentially entertaining people. And then, and then just kind of like pinging interesting people that have a following and get them to be aware of what you're doing. And then you find that they want to share it later. But it always comes down to just like actual value. Good Got value. It. Got it. Um, yeah, I just clicked the link to, I think this is a great playbook. So guys do definitely have a look at this deck that Lenny shared. And if you like it, do give him a shout out. I hope it helps you guys. So moving on to the next one, um, it's around the acquisitions and around your first startup, Local Mind. Um, what inspired you to start that? How did the acquisition happen? Anything that you can share with us? And um, if you can link this to domain experience, given that you know uh, you got into a product role at Airbnb because of this acquisition. So did that domain experience really help you? Is this something that is important in general product roles? Got it. Uh, the experience did not help me very much at Airbnb, to be <laughs> honest, partly because I moved from engineering into product when I got there and I had no idea what I was doing as a product manager when I first started. Mm. But in terms of uh, the company, uh, so Local Mind was the company that I started and it was a location-based app that allowed you to talk to people that are anywhere in the world and find out what's happening there right now. So you could ask someone how long is a line at this restaurant or is this, uh, is this restaurant any good? And that was the app. So you pick a place and you talk to people. Um, and the idea for it came from around the time Foursquare released their API back in the day when check-ins were very cool. We started, I started thinking about like, what can we do with this cool data about people sharing their location and opting into sharing where they're at. And the idea was, okay, what if we just like take all this data of where people are at and connect them to people that are interested in knowing what's happening at that place. Mm -hmm. And so the idea came from this like shift in, in tech almost that there's this data available. And, and the, so that was the inspiration. And then the way we got acquired by Airbnb, uh, the first step was I was at South by Southwest and Austin met the head of product at Airbnb randomly. And then a year later they came back to us because he remembered us and they had a problem they wanted solved. And he thought that we would be a good team to solve it. And so initially we started talking about partnerships uh, and maybe working together and eventually led to an acquisition. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for sharing that journey as well. Uh, I think one more question and I'll just sum this up with I think two, three other ones that we had earlier. Um, this is again regarding the newsletter. So any frameworks that you are currently following to generate this content, maybe, you know, anything that around researching ideas, if you've covered it in the deck, then maybe that is something that we'll refer. I think it was interesting. Yeah. So, so the way the newsletter works is it's, it's, a, it's an advice column where people send me questions and answer questions. So I have this very, it's like an increasingly long backlog of questions and I just have a big list and I try to pick things that I'm just excited about looking into because then the content will be really interesting. So the framework is just what is most interesting and timely. And then plus like, you know, if they're a paid subscriber, I bump them to the top. Um, and then I have to decide, do I wanna go super deep and spend like months looking at this thing or do I just answer it directly this week? And so what I'm trying to do right now is every month I go really deep on a question and then every other week in between I, I answer it uh, directly but not spend you know months researching so so it's mostly mostly based on just like interest level because the more interested i am about it the better it's going to be interesting 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 um jumping into the next set i think this is more on the investment career so clubbing a bunch of questions here first bit would be around now that you've jumped to the other side you're looking at a bunch of startups so any metrics that you currently look at to judge early stage startups and maybe specific to marketplace or we can take that you know to be generic and second part is any interesting startups that are not in stealth but anything that you can share uh, which might be interesting for you know the asian counterparts here most of our audience is based out of asia so two questions there okay sure 
So, so the first is what do I look for in an early stage startup? So as an investor, you basically want to cheat as much as possible and have as much evidence that this is going to be an amazing, huge business. And so early stage, there's not like any, there's rarely any traction and there's rarely revenue or anything like that. So what you want to look at is all the other signals that tell you this is going to be really successful. So the most common are just like, how great is this team? How fast do they move? How much experience do they have? How well do they work together? How much have they built up to now? How much research have they done? So there's like the team part, just like how is this the team to build this thing? Because I've seen so many startups where like, oh, wow, that's such a good idea. And then it's like, you know, some really smart people, but they're not like the best people to build this company. And then like a month later, I see the same exact idea, but with like the best people building that same idea. And so learning I have is just like, wait for that group to come together versus that's just an amazing idea. So to the team, you want to think about the market, like how big can this get? You know, if someone has an amazing idea, but there's only a hundred people that will ever buy it, there's not much of a business to be built there. So team market. Um, and then there's just like, how much have they learned already about this thing? How much research have they done? How much design have they done? How much prototyping? Um, I'd say those are the most interesting things. Um, and then you want to think about like, can they build a moat? Can they, is the business model good? Is it high margins? Are there network effects? How do they grow this thing? So that's, that's roughly that's how I think about it. Okay. And then the other question is, are there, are there any like super interesting marketplaces that are, haven't been done maybe? Uh, if there were, I would either start it or <laughs> I would have invested in it by now. So there's not like some magical idea that I have of like, oh my God, someone needs to do this. It's going to be huge. But there's a ton of really interesting marketplace companies happening. Like there's a bunch of B2B marketplaces that are starting to emerge that are really interesting. Like there's one that's like a restaurant repair, uh, a restaurant repair marketplace. There's like a grocery delivery for the grocery store marketplace. So there's a lot of Cool B2B to yeah, B2B. Yeah, and... B2B. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. There's like all the research I did, you might notice is all B2C. Yeah. Yep. Consumer. And it's because there aren't actually many big B2B marketplaces. There's just okay. like Alibaba. Yep. And like maybe a part of Amazon. But now more recently, there's a lot more B2B marketplaces happening. Got it. And so I'm excited Got it. to watch Got them. Got it. There's an interesting one in India to put on. I think you would have heard it's one of the fastest growing unicorns in India. So oh, well, tell me about it later. Is... <laughs> for sure. Great. For sure. Uh, moving on to the next set of questions, I think uh, this is around skills and career. I think most of our audience today is uh, product managers, founders, and senior PMs, and a bunch of aspiring ones. So, clubbing a bunch of questions there. First is around you know growth bit of product management. You know, how does one enter? Do you need like an MBA? How much technical do you need? So, skills there, and maybe you could end it with any general career advice. You you've worked across you know multiple acquisitions, big companies, small companies, anything that you know you've seen common pitfalls that you know early stage guys, mid twenties, thirties that you know they can probably learn from. I know it's gone general, but just trying to trying to club a bunch of questions. I like how you pack every into two questions into each question. <laughs> I'm trying my best. So, so the first question is what are important skills to get good at as a PM or how to get into product management? Uh, it's more on getting into the growth side of PM. I think you have a great article. Oh, on... growth PM. Yep. I see, I see. Yep. Got it. Yeah. So I think the way you get into it, you just find a time to do it. Like you find an opportunity to do it. So the way I got into growth, is I just like realized, hey, I should learn how to do growth. And so I was at Airbnb and I was just telling my manager, I would love to work on a growth team. And then an opportunity came up and so I did it. Fair. So I think, I think it's mainly just like look for openings and essentially most of product management is growth. You're normally trying to grow something, some metric, some business outcome. And so it's often very similar experience to just like focused growth, just like optimizing a funnel and performance marketing and referrals. Yeah. So you often have the right experience to give it a try. Got so it. that's one. Two is maybe find like a growth person that you work with at your company or that you know about in the world and get them to give you advice on things they should be working on, like run Facebook ads for your own project and optimize your funnel and just start to pick up some of the terminology and skills that uh, 
that those folks have. Right. Um, and then the second question was. This was around uh, general, you know, career advice. I think a bunch of questions around how do I break into PM? Any thoughts around, you know, you worked across multiple. How do I? So any career advice? I think this is more generic, but let's keep it focused on product. Maybe you know, breaking into PM. A couple of questions around, you know, how is MBA important for product management? Do you think that is important? And how much of a technical skill does one need to have to get into product management? Okay, yeah, so I have this post I'll share. Yeah, that's the best. I, I was thinking the same thing. You could just add the <laughs> link to that and we can move on. Yeah, so like my secret is anytime I, I get asked things enough times, I just write it down because I forget oh. the best answer and then it gives yep. me a chance just to put it out of my head and then I forget it all. So I actually refer back to it when I think about the stuff, but there's there's essentially four ways to get into product manager that management right. that I've seen. Right. Either you transition from an existing company, sorry, inside of an existing company from like engineering to product or design to product or data to product. So one is the transitioning. And I think that's the easiest by far if you can pull that off because you have a lot of support. You don't have to like not have a job. There's people there to help you. Uh, and so I would try to do that if you can. Two is just finding like a junior PM role at a large company where they have like an APM program like Facebook or Google and a few others. And then that's where an MBA helps is you come into it with something, but I don't, it's definitely not necessary. It's just like you have a leg up on other people. Um, you could join a startup as like, that just needs a PM to help organize and execute. And then the other is, I'm just like, be on the side scrolling through this article because I forget all these things. <laughs> uh, starting a company, that's how I got into product manager. You start a company, product management, you start a company and then you get acquired <laughs> and then you're a product manager because usually the, the founders, uh, if they're not engineers, become product managers. Right. So those are the four most common paths. And that's the last one's probably the hardest. <laughs> Yep, that's right. That's right. And I think, guys, you should definitely check out the article as well. I think Lenny's gone into a lot of detail on that. So you should, I mean, most of these questions should be, you, I mean, he, you, you definitely find a lot of value in most of the content that he has there. Uh, Lenny was running out of time. So maybe I'll just pick up a question or two to probably wrap this up. Some interesting questions. Uh, one of them here is, uh, we've seen ton of audio platform, but uh, very few getting initial traction like Clubhouse. So, you know, any thoughts on GTM? What do you think is working for them, which didn't work for a lot of others? Yeah, I have another whole article about this thing. Yep. So guys, <laughs> definitely keep an eye out on the chat section. Uh, he'd love to cover this in detail, but given the time constraints we're trying. Okay. No, no, it's all good. Most so, of yeah, yeah. So like that article has a lot of the information. I even cover Club, Clubhouse. Yep. Um, but I think basically consumer apps are just very hard because yeah, yeah. there's so much going on in the world. And there's so many apps and so many sites and so many podcasts and so many things to watch on TV that getting any attention for what you're building it, that isn't like a real pain point is, is very hard. And so that's why consumer apps have been just kind of like, uh, just like dead for a while. There's only like TikTok, uh, you know, Snapchat a while ago, and now Clubhouse is starting to emerge. And there's, you know, there's more, but it's very hard to break through essentially because there's so much out there. And so the question is, how do you, how do you do that? And how did Clubhouse do that? And I think what Clubhouse did is they, they basically focused on a very niche audience, which is tech and VC people. And then created this interesting FOMO where everyone on Twitter is just like, Hey, are you in Clubhouse yet? And it created this like interest in, Oh, what is Clubhouse? Yeah. And the article I wrote talks about that. So I think it's a combination of focus on a specific audience and then reaching out to them and getting them in and then creating FOMO. But again, it comes back to product market fit. Like it actually is a really cool product and it wouldn't work even if you did all those things, if it wasn't actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. And so, so that is always going to be important. Um, and now I think the question is, can they grow from, you know, this very niche VC tech audience to everybody in the world? Are they actually worth a hundred million dollars? Or, or more. Yeah, yeah but I think that'll be interesting to watch as well. So I think there are tons of other questions that are pouring in lots around Airbnb. Uh, how much time do you have any time to extend this? Oh, we jump? can go for another like 10 minutes if you, if awesome, you want. Awesome, awesome. I think that'll be great. So I'll pick up a couple around Airbnb. I think uh, interesting uh, sections on um, 
one on stakeholder management so you know how does one work on problems that come that that generally involve multiple product teams to work together so you know like a marketplace like airbnb you'd have had the host someone working on the host side someone working on guests someone working on growth so how does all that fit in together as you scale yeah it's that's a very complex question so i guess the the way i think about this question is what's an what are some tactics to be good at managing stakeholders because yeah as a company grows and i'm sure I imagine many of you working in big companies there's a lot of complexity in politics and and i don't know slowdown that happens with all of these other folks that have to be in the loop so a few things i found useful one is always think about what is the other person trying to achieve what are their goals what do they want and how is what you're doing going to help them and make that clear to them if you're trying to launch a project and you're you know trying to convince a stakeholder to be on board you want to think about how is this going to help their goals because that's what they're trying to hit and make that very explicit um two is just be very communicative with people keep them in the loop they'll never feel don't they should never feel like they're surprised by by what you're doing and they the more they feel like they're a part of what you're building the more likely they're going to be on board and supportive and excited about what you're doing. So loop them in early, get their feedback, give them updates on how it's going. Uh, that helps a lot. Um, three is try to find like, there's kind of these like levels of stakeholders. There's people that actually have decision-making power. Then there's people that just want to stay in the loop. And then there's like, get out of here. We don't need you on this project. And so, it's valuable to kind of make it clear you're a decision maker. You're just like, you're going to be updated. And then like, do you really want to be involved in this project? We don't really, you know, we have enough people in this involved. You mind if we just kind of move on without you? Um, so I find that's useful to just like make clear to people their role and who's, who's a blocker and who's just like keep them in the loop. So maybe, they, maybe those are three things for yeah. you. Thanks for covering that. I think, yeah, I mean, the question definitely needs a longer deep down on this. So maybe one of your future posts for sure. Yep. Uh, another question, uh, I think clubbing a bunch of them are around early stage marketplace problems versus, you know, scaling marketplaces. So things like uh, trust, things like quality, how do you look at these, you know, early stage, it's very important to build trust. So that becomes a huge challenge. How do you tackle that versus, you know, when you're scaling quality becomes a challenge. So any thoughts on this that you'd like to share from your learnings? Yeah, trust. Yeah, trust is extremely important, especially if it's like an Airbnb or an Uber, where yep. you have to like, you know, you're in a kind of a dangerous situation. And I've been thinking about adding that to this research because I it didn't come up a ton, it turns out, yeah. in the work. Yeah. But it is clearly very important for a lot of companies to get right initially, yeah. like Airbnb, for example. So, so I think, yeah, so I think trust is extremely important to figure out. So the yeah. question is, as you're building a marketplace, how do you, how do you co communicate that you can trust yeah. this thing? So for Airbnb, it was reviews were really powerful, where other people staying at the place make you feel like, oh, other people have stayed there and they had a great time, so I should feel good about this. And then the so that was on the guest side, as reviews were really powerful, and then word of mouth alongside that, where like your friend tells you it's great, that makes you feel more trusted trusting of it. So I think those work together really well. And then on the supply side for Airbnb, at least the host guarantee was really big where you get initially $10,000 and then a million dollars of, of protection if something goes wrong. And I think with Uber, similarly word of mouth on the demand side, you kept hearing from your friends and everyone's having a great time. And so you start to trust it plus the reviews and then on the supply side, I'm not sure what they did there, but I think there's probably an insurance policy. Got it. Yeah, got so it. it is really important to get right. Yeah, got it, got it. And on on the scaling bit, um, how do you deal with the challenge of you know quality? I think you know as you scale, um, it's also important to early on you have fewer properties. It's easier to you know maybe do it manually, maybe have those checked. So was this automated in you know with your review system or were there anything specific that you can share? Yeah, yeah. So Airbnb, the most important levers were we set standards for the minimum quality of a host, and then we kicked the host off if they fell below those standards with warnings and education. But it. it turned out that was 
by far the biggest lever for quality is just kick hosts off that are doing a bad job because if you don't and they keep getting bookings they're gonna Mm -hmm. they're gonna keep doing what they're doing so so that was really important and then early on um onboarding them manually was really valuable just like an ops person just like helping them set up their listing Fair. was really good yeah. was really yeah. valuable for uh, yeah, making sure that uh, listings look yeah. good yep i think we've all come across that article where they talk about how early early on uh chesky goes about you know uh they filmed in new york i think um not sure who shared this but you know they went around filming and taking photographs and helping host mm-hmm. with that listing getting those quality you know doing things mm-hmm. that don't scale but doing that you know early on so i think that is right yeah that helped with trust too even yep. more than quality because yep. the places looked good they didn't look like a place you'd you die yep, yep. um awesome i think uh, we still have like i think the questions are pouring and we still have about 51 to cover so to do one thing i'll i'll, I'll just do one thing i'll probably share the questions with you in case you could cover them whenever you know if you find some interesting points here you could cover them in your future um yeah newsletters. uh one interesting question that came up was um, does lenny have like an exclusive coupon for the tpf crowd that's here today so i do there oh, you go awesome. yes yeah, so i made awesome. a 20% discount for everyone okay. that's here right now which i don't i that's try awesome. not to do i try not to do discounts so but yeah I mean, here you go i put it in the that's chat awesome. that's awesome thanks so that much for that yeah, that yeah you yeah, bet. I think that's good. so is, guys he's, he's great, put it up in great crew. Up, Yep, he's he's put it up in the chat section. So if you guys love the content, do check out. He has a bunch of. Uh, I think you have a free. Yeah, you do have a free newsletter that that's pretty regular too. So sign up to that, and in case you like that, um, do use the coupon. And um, yeah, with that, I think thanks so much for joining us, Lenny. Today. I think we love this session, and uh, we'll also uh, like uh, we'll share the deck with you guys over email. So everyone who's registered for this. Um, We'll, we'll try getting the deck. If you have any questions, I think Lenny is super active on Twitter. So do follow him. Uh, do give him a shout out on any feedback. That on Twitter is the best way, right, Lenny? How, how would you suggest yeah. them? Yeah, yeah Twitter is great. I'm going to send a link in the chat to my Twitter yep. in case you guys want to chat. You can just DM me if you guys awesome. want to chat. Awesome. So guys, definitely uh, uh, we're open to feedback. So uh, feel free to share uh, what you liked, anything that we could improve. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a round two with Lenny sometime in the future. So thanks so much, Lenny, for joining us today. We love the session. Uh, you hope bet. To thanks, guys. Any, any closing thoughts, anything that you'd like to wrap up with? Uh, no. Chat, follow me on Twitter and <laughs> DM me if you want to, if you have any follow-up questions. And for sure, thanks for, for sure. having me. This is great. Awesome. You guys got a great group here. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lenny. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. We'll stay in touch. We have a bunch of events coming up, so feel free to follow us on Twitter as well. And uh, we'll share all the material that Lenny, the awesome material that he has. We'll share that with you all. And look out for the email. So have a great week ahead. See you guys. Until next time. Thanks again, Lenny.